Good afternoon. Pastor John Davis of the Amityville Community Church. Let us ask the wonderful God to bless our time in, in prayer in his word. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask right now for your divine instruction, wisdom, and insight as we go into your passage, as we go into your word, as we discuss passages, that you may grant us understanding that is in agreement with your word, an understanding that is uh, accurate according to your gospel, and that is divinely given by the power of your Holy Spirit. Your word is spiritual, and the natural man cannot receive it. Grant us hearts to understand and obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good afternoon again. And we're going to be continuing our second installment, our second part of the role of women in ministry. And as I begin this, want to make clear that as we discuss this, let us understand that the culture in which we live is somewhat akin to the culture of the book of Judges. I'm going to read a passage from the book of Judges, Judges 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It says it twice in the book of Judges. We clearly see in our day that we have such a wide variety of opinions about all matters. If you ask somebody what is most important, some might tell you the preservation of the planet, the, the global warming. Some might tell you the issue of abortion. Some might tell you the issue of the uh, transgender movement or sexual freedom. Some might tell you the, the racial climate. And while that is understandable in the secular realm, we would like to think that in the church of Jesus Christ, that there would be more uniformity, more agreement because we have a document, we have a body of truth which should lead us to a certain central point of view, a certain unity of thought being the Bible. But we could clearly see that even churches uh, who would have claimed to have been Christian churches Biblical churches. Now, there are churches now that will tell you that they do not believe the whole Bible, and that's a whole different discussion there. But even within churches where the Bible is used as the primary uh, text, the primary source of knowledge, there is still a wide range of disagreement. So as we embark upon this issue, what I hope to do is to present you some some biblical truth to give you a thorough understanding of this issue. And I did say thorough. As I said before, you will note that I really don't quote any extra biblical sources. I don't go into uh, articles written outside. We're looking at the Bible strictly. So in saying that, I would like to remind you again of Acts 17:11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. I'm not going to revisit that, but so we have one aspect of how we learn. We have to study, and it appears that it has to be a rigorous daily uh, endeavor to study the word, to understand the word, to test and prove if what is being said is accurate. But I'd also like to introduce Acts chapter 8, verse 29, and reading down to verse 31. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near, Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot, overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? 
And he said, how can I understand? How can I? Unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Acts 8, 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you were reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, this passage, and as hopefully as you see these scriptures, they may shed light on other subjects because the, the breadth of truth is quite broad in the scriptures, how it applies to over, overlapping issues, subjects, and topics. But this particular, and it's an Ethiopian eunuch, um, what a humble attitude. Notice what he says. How can I unless someone guides me? What we have what we have come to in our day is that, and I, and I say this, understand, nobody claims to be an electrician if they haven't practiced or studied it. Nobody claims to be a brain surgeon if they haven't taken courses, studied it, done their internship, all of their medical boards. But yet everyone believes they can pick up the Bible and understand it. And these are people sometimes who haven't even read the Bible completely. Some may have read it on that once a year Bible program, and they have now fancied themselves as experts. But any true Bible teacher lets you know that the more you read, the more you need to read. All of that to be said, that this Ethiopian eunuch is admitting that he needs someone to guide him through the scriptures. I'm going to tell you that I'm hoping to do that. You will judge right now, you will judge right now from what I'm saying, if it's biblical. I'm not asking if you agree, I'm just asking if you can see what I am saying is biblical and understand the two may be different. People will read things in the Bible and simply dismiss it as we discussed earlier. Moving more into the issue now, I'm going to open up this dialogue about the role of women in ministry. And I'm going to hope to give you a, an example of how individuals who are poorly taught, and I did say poorly taught, how they misrepresent the scripture. So we have a passage, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, that passage says quite a bit. It's talking about salvation or redemption and that there is an equality in the body of Christ in, our, in regards to Jesus. And some will look at this passage. And I'm hoping that this will whet your appetite for what's coming up. So they would look at this passage and say, see, there is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And they will go on to tell you that men and women can all have the same roles because we are all believers in Jesus. Now, look at closely what it says. There is neither male nor female. Well, do men have babies? No, I'm not being facetious or sarcastic. I'm being quite straightforward. We immediately see that there is still an inequality of physical ability. Physical ability. There's an inequality. Men cannot have babies. Women have ovaries. Men have a different genetical part. I say that because when the Bible says there is neither male nor female, it is talking about our spiritual standing. It is not talking about the erasing and the nullification of all gender roles. Very important. If you read the Bible, does not the Bible still talk about husbands and wives? Doesn't Jesus say God in the beginning created them male and female? Matthew 19. Doesn't the Bible talk about husbands and wives, uh, mothers and fathers? 
So in saying that, we realize that even the Apostle Paul who wrote this wrote about husbands and wives, different roles for different genders. Does not mean that there is a greater spiritual standing before Jesus, but it does mean that there are different roles. Sons should obey fathers. Daughters should obey mothers. So we don't just throw out these roles. So hopefully this will give you an idea just to open your mind that when it says there is neither male nor female in the spiritual application of our redemption, our salvation, our regeneration, our justification, our adoption into the body of Christ. Yes, male and female are all adopted. However, we realize that even in the roles that God has given us, we'll see in Timothy, it talks about childbearing. Men do not bear children. Now, I don't want to belabor this now, but I bring it up to show you that there are people who are poorly taught, and maybe you hadn't even seen that truth in this passage, that it sounds so profound that men and women should be able to do everything in the church equally, but yet this passage does not support that. I also want to bring to your attention another passage, because this issue, especially the role of women in the church, it is quite a volatile quite a, it's quite an, a debated issue in our day. In John chapter 12, verse 42, this is what it says. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, if you are a person who is aware of biblical truth and aware of the teachings of Jesus, we need to be honest that there is a cultural and there is a pressure from society to conform to society. Even here, that the people who believed in Jesus wouldn't confess it publicly. Churches are under great pressure because we live in a society where certain, certain beliefs, there are certain uh, ideologies, and the idea that a church would restrict the role of women from being a pastor, the role of women from teaching, uh, teaching men especially, that that is unheard of in our day. That church would be labeled as archaic, chauvinistic. Some would even bring lawsuits against that church. So we need to understand that this issue, just because we see many churches practicing it, doesn't even mean that all of the leaders believe it. Sometimes leaders will capitulate. They will succumb because the pressure from the world around them and many times the pressure from within the ranks. We realize that sometimes pastors, they may have individuals whose the, the ladies are the biggest donors to the church. The ladies feel unrepresented by the clergy. They feel that they do not have a voice, that men cannot really understand their issues. So we want to just understand this and, and it's interesting however one wants to look at the bible god and his providence that all the actual writers of scripture were men two books in particular focus on the lives of ladies but the actual people who penned the scriptures were men they were scribes so god has ordained a certain system now i know that already some of you are cutting this off you you what is he saying I'm, I'm, all I can ask is that you would hear me out, is that you would hear out and look at the scriptures. So we also want to keep in mind 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
First Corinthians chapter two. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, this, this, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that lets us know that biblical truth, spiritual truth, divine truth, eternal truth can only be understood when the Holy Spirit illuminates the mind. Yes, we could understand that there is one God, but to really understand what one God means in all of its ramifications, we need the Holy Spirit. One God, if God is not the author of confusion, is going to mean one way. So we realize that that's why even the idea of one God is highly debated. I'm going to open up this dialogue further and just ask you a question. Because many people who would separate the Bible from Jesus, they do that. They separate the Bible from Jesus. Well, Jesus, the Bible, and, and, and it's almost like in some minds it's two whole different entities. But think of this. Did Jesus choose any apostles who were female? Let me ask that question again. Did Jesus choose any apostles who were female? That's interesting because while people love to lord Jesus, applaud him, and use his name with such reverence, such adoration, rightfully so, yet in this particular line of thinking, they quickly divorce themselves from Jesus. They do not make verbal comments at the risk of sounding irreverent, but they divorce themselves in thought and in practice from the great Savior. Jesus chose 12 apostles. They were all men. Mind you, one of the men betrayed him, Judas. Peter denied him verbally. They all eventually scattered. Anyone who reads the resurrection accounts, the women were first at the tomb. The women went and told the apostles. Yet even in that, Jesus did not remove the male apostles. He continued with that pattern of male leadership. You did hear me say that pattern of male leadership. So I bring that up to quickly get to the issue of this, of this, of, of trying to present Jesus as something different than the Bible. He is the word of God incarnate. He's the word made flesh who dwelt among us, John 1, 14. But we have this, for lack of a better term, we'll call it this schizophrenic thinking in the church. I love Jesus, but I only believe parts of the Bible. So we have this, and I bring this up immediately because I want to at least keep some of you engaged because you will dismiss so many other passages, so many other texts, so many other references. So I went right to the master teacher. And again, being that Jesus says, even in regards to Judas, did I not choose one of you and one of you is a devil? John chapter six, Peter denies him. They all eventually fled. They all were cowering in a room because of fear of the Jews. You could read that in the gospels. After Jesus is crucified, the ladies are at the tomb, the women, the women, they're the first ones to search out the body. They're the first ones to actually see the risen Christ. They're the ones to go and tell the disciples. And yet, and yet Jesus, he didn't, and even if he didn't disqualify the apostles, why did he not then incorporate women into the apostolic uh, into the apostolic band? Why did he not incorporate women into the apostolic role? Why didn't he say, I'm going to keep these 11, Judas, 
is deceased at this point. I'm going to keep these 11, but I'm going to add women because surely women have demonstrated greater faith. Surely women have great, demonstrated greater devotion. Surely these women in their in their enthusiasm, in their devotion, in their adoration for the Savior, they're at the tomb before the break of day. Why didn't Jesus incorporate women? Jesus, not Moses in the Old Testament, not Paul, who some have called chauvinistic. Why did not Jesus? Now, some would tell you that Jesus was restricted by culture. Jesus has a woman touching his feet, pouring out ointment on him. Jesus is healing people on the Sabbath. What would give someone the idea that Jesus is restricted by culture? What would give any person who has any any basic understanding of Jesus' ministry that he is restricted by culture. Clearly we see that he is performing acts and executing his ministry in such a way that the Pharisees are accusing him of having a demon. They're accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. They're accusing him of all types of violations of the word of God. It does not seem that at any point in time that Jesus is concerned about cultural or religious protocols that are not thoroughly biblical. Let me say that again. Jesus is not concerned with any cultural, social, or religious protocols or regulations that are not that are not thoroughly biblical we see jesus talking to a samaritan woman so if someone was to tell you that jesus was somewhat restricted or jesus was mindful of cultural taboo you would be right to think they are clueless about the ministry of jesus clueless. Jesus never defers what is right, what is biblically right for the sake of cultural taboo. Clearly he offends the religious leaders. And if you read Matthew 23, he even tells the people to obey the Pharisees, obey them for they sit in Moses seat. He says, do what they say, but don't do what they do. So even in his regard for the Pharisees and Sadducees, he still heals on the Sabbath. He still is talking to Samaritan woman. He's still having this woman who touches him, his, his, uh, his, his friendship with sinners led them to call him a, a wine bibber, a drunkard and a glutton. So I bring Jesus up first. That when Jesus founded the New Testament church, he did set a standard. He set a protocol of leadership. It is 12 men. Eventually they choose a replacement, but it is men. Women were clearly present. Women supported his ministry. No doubt women are thoroughly blessed by Jesus and a blessing to Jesus. And yet Jesus never incorporated women into the apostolic ranks of leadership. And so when Jesus sets forth the New Testament church, what a perfect time to incorporate women to start to eradicate what some might have thought was a chauvinistic or simply a male dominated lineage of authority. So that is a mouthful right there. Again, we're going to we're going to pause there and and that is very important. These two passages, the Galatians, there is neither male nor female, and we're going to look at other passages. We're going to look at quite a few of them. There is ma neither male nor female. Hopefully I've eradicated misunderstanding that 
because it's not male on female, the Bible still uses the term husband and wife, mother and father, son and daughter. It uses those terms. It identifies women and men. So because in spiritual standing before God, we are equal, it does not mean that all aspects of our of our life are the same. I didn't say in equal, but are not the same. Men do not give birth. Men do not breastfeed children. So, so we, we understand that there are still physiological differences. And those terms, there are, there are gender roles assigned, husband, wife. In our society where these roles are, are trying to be eradicated, Again, in the church, we're trying to be mindful of this. I'm hoping to give you a, an overview of this as we go on to show that the church needs to remain faithful to the word of God. And I will turn to one last passage just so we could understand this. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What we're investigating, what we are exploring, what the thrust of our dialogue is, is about the role of ministry in the church for women, in the church. We are not talking about in the secular world. We are talking about in the church of the living God, the house of God. And the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. So I bring that up to under, so you could understand. We're not going to be comparing ourselves with what goes on at Wall Street and the corporate glass ceiling. We're not comparing ourselves with how far women have come in politics. We're not comparing how far women have come in media and entertainment. We are talking about the church of Jesus Christ and the structure and the biblical boundaries that have been established by God Almighty throughout the ages. So we're going to break for that right now. And again, we started off because some would say, oh, well, that's Paul writing that. That's, a, that's an accusation. That's Paul writing. But understand, we see that Jesus himself did not choose any women apostles, even in light of the cowardice and the betrayal and the denial of his male appointed apostles, he still, did, he still did not alter the rank of apostleship to include females. So when we read what the apostle Paul, a person, if they're going to be legitimate, has to at least wrestle with what Jesus did. Because people will always say, oh, that's Paul, that's not Jesus. Well, again, Jesus having the opportunity, and even when you consider Paul, here is a as we would say in the vernacular, a late comer to the apostolic rank. And still Jesus chose him on the road to Damascus. Jesus did not choose a woman on the road to Damascus. He didn't choose one of the women even at that point by Acts chapter 9. If somebody wants to argue that, then that's a whole nother argument. But we see that the apostle Paul was chosen by Jesus. Why didn't Jesus choose? Mary, a Phoebe, why didn't he choose a Lydia or a Dorcas? No, he still chose another man. So we're going to break there. This is our second session. And hopefully this will encourage you to tune in. There's much more to cover, much more to cover. But these are just some of the basic questions about the apostolic ranks and about Jesus methods of ministry that hopefully will shed greater light on this subject about women in the role of authority, pastor, or elder. Be blessed in Jesus. Amen and amen.